Jason, you're the CEO and executive producer at Lost Sky Entertainment, working with VR and video games, but the topic of Chinese censorship is not new to you at all. Uh, what first got you interested in the topic leading to 2020's documentary, Ask No Questions? So I actually made both films, Ask No Questions, and this latest film, Eternal Spring, at the same time. Eternal Spring is this big, ambitious, animated project, and we're an indie studio. So we hacked away at that one for six years, and <laughs> Ask No Questions was made kind of in the middle of it. So um, we kind of leaped from, or we leapt from uh, from the gaming space, and we still are in the gaming space, into this into these documentaries um it started with dashong this character uh, you know film subject here he was an artist we'd heard about we were doing a kung fu video game that featured a lot of hand-drawn artwork and he was just this really talented uh, comic book illustrator who originally came from china and was living in new york and he'd drawn for justice league and star wars and all of this and of course he'd also worked with uh, louis cha who is uh, sort of the preeminent kung fu novelist in china so i thought great this guy's got amazing talent he's also um, you know, he's got the cultural background and we wanted that authenticity in our in our game. It was called Shuya and Saga. It was a narrative game. And uh, we brought him up and he, he was helping us with 1400 hand drawn panels that were in the game. And as we were collaborating, we learned that uh, he came from the same hometown as my wife and filmmaking partner, Masha Loftus. But Masha was the, the daughter of a, a mid level government official in China. She had, you know, no connection with any religious or dissident communities there. She wasn't familiar with the Falun Gong community that Dashong was part of. I mean, she'd heard about it from the state sort of denouncement campaign, but she didn't know anyone. And so hearing what Dashong had experienced, hearing what other people had endured in her own hometown, uh, that combined with, for me, I was familiar with Falun Gong already. I had come across it when I was in high school. Uh, because of an interest in meditation and Eastern philosophy. And I had a, a built-in sort of um, concern for the human rights situation in China by the time I had come across Dashong. So collectively between Masha and myself, we both had compelling reasons to, to pursue the story with Dashong because essentially, you know, for your, for your audience, it's, um, it's a, a heist story. Uh, this group, Falun Gong, it's a spiritual group that's been persecuted in China. It became very popular prior to being banned. Uh, and some estimates say even outnumbered membership of the Communist Party in China. So the communist rulers were concerned about this large spiritual group. They banned it. Uh, and from there, people who persisted in practicing it were thrown into labor camps, tortured, this kind of thing. But what really fueled it was a, a continual state media campaign to say that Falun Gong was evil and dangerous and had to be uprooted. And this is where the story sort of takes off for this film, Eternal Spring, is that you know, these individuals felt they had no recourse. They felt they couldn't get their, their message out in any way to counter the state narrative. So they hatched a plan to climb the television poles and uh, sort of bring home DVD players. They were essentially CD-ROMs at the time and, and play their own program to counter the state narrative over the airwaves. And Dashong, uh, the artist that we connected with is caught up in all of this because he's uh, a part of the Falun Gong community uh, in China. He is However, not someone who's directly involved in this hijacking effort, but he feels the brunt of it anyway, because he has to flee his hometown in the aftermath. They were just arresting everybody, trying to find out who was involved. So he has this really compelling personal connection to it, and it impacted his life so much. He'd been making drawings about this event, oh, wow. and we just thought, you know what? Um, it would be remarkable to take his art and try and bring that to life through the, the small animation group that we have into a kind of animated documentary that explores this, you know, remarkable high story and the, the human cost that, that resulted from it. And the animation really is so crisp and almost video game like in a, a, a lot of ways. And I really love hearing that it's influenced by his own drawings. I think that really just gives an authentic vibe to the entire film. And that's what I wanted to ask you about meeting with uh, Dashong and, you know, learning from him firsthand what he experienced. Uh, you know, he was a practitioner who escaped for, uh, to North America from there. Um, it brings a whole new level of emotion to the storytelling. Uh, how did that sort of come about? Did he know what story he wanted to tell? Or was this through conversation that you, you both determined sort of this is the direction we're going with Eternal Spring? So Dashong knows drawing, right? This is how he communicates. And I think you could tell that something was, he was carrying something with him because he was making drawings about this story. It was something that impacted him. Um, but I think what excited me as a filmmaker is that, you know, there's been other films that have used animation very well. Flea was a big hit last year. We had, you know, for me, like a number of years ago with Waltz Absolutely. with the Sheer, which kind of straddled that 
documentary or biography, it, you know, what was it really, but it was a great film and Tower I enjoy. There's a number of other ones that have used animation very well over the years in different styles. But what really got me with this film was, okay, hold on, with Dashong, we have a film subject. We have someone who is essentially a character in the film and his artistic process is an opportunity for him to get closer to this event and come to hopefully some kind of new understanding about it because he begins with some mixed feelings you know he obviously is sympathetic to the effort to get the word out counter the government's narrative but at the same time the hammer came down so heavily and he suffered a lot that you know there's a number of people who are like was this the right thing did we poke the bear did it did it make things worse right and and people suffered as a result so I liked that he had an unanswered question that he was willing to explore with us. And then you see, as he meets these other individuals, the witnesses who knew the characters, you know, the, the subjects in the film very well. And then, of course, Mr. White, uh, you know, the one individual who is directly involved in the, in the TV hijacking and probably the only surviving uh, hijacker to have ever come out of China. When we made that connection, that was just that was uh, you know, golden for us because then we were able to explore this story in, in full depth, know everything about the plan, why they carried it out, what happened to everybody, yeah. what their thought process was, but also for Dashong to get that direct connection. So why did you do this? What was going through your mind? And to come to some kind of new appreciation about these characters. So what excited me about the artistic aspect and using animation in this film is that there's still a third of the film is live action. And we see Dashong's drawing. We see how art can help him to come to a new understanding, how, har how art can hopefully come to uh, help us to bring some kind of catharsis or healing. And I think that that arc and seeing just what happens is that, you know, instead of it being this decision by the invisible hand of the director, who's like, we're going to animate all these recreations we pull the curtain back and you see the process and Absolutely. you see you see his nostalgia and now you know when you see this those memories of his childhood and what the city meant to him you know that that's through his filter and that's that's colored with his own emotions right and then similarly when he's dealing with these dark memories of having himself been arrested and tortured you realize that that is also layering it you can see it in his artwork and so seeing that the change in his work through the different process like stages of this story and and also how that culminates in some kind of understanding at the end i felt that that makes art a character essentially or part of that story arc and that to me was very exciting and unique I'm really glad that you mentioned Flea because when I finished this movie, my first thought quite honestly was Eternal Spring is this year's Flea. Uh, it just has that impact. It is emotional. It is historic. It is really authentic in a way that uh, it tells a story that needs to be told. And I, I really commend you and especially Dashang for that as well. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking, you mentioned your wife and her upbringing and sort of the process of developing this, this story or telling this story. How has learning about all this been for your wife, been for you, and really kind of working through the stories of all of these lives lost as a result of this as well and the lives impacted? Yeah, there's a lot of layers to that. So, you know, I'm fortunate because, you know, for me, a little bit of background, like these are these telling these stories are not easy, not just for the subjects who are coming out of China, who still have connections in China who have family and such there, you always wanna be aware of what kind of impact you're potentially creating with what you're doing. But I learned something from these individuals who are coming out, the survivors. They, first of all, they had gone through so much uh, in, in order to persist and be able to tell their story. So it did not take a lot of convincing in, in any of these cases for someone to open up and wanna share their story. But they also mentioned that they felt the best recourse they had was to shine a light on what they had endured. And, and so what you'll hear from some people who were in a labor camp or in a prison in China, they may have been tortured and then all of a sudden their circumstances improve some way and they don't know why. And then they come outside of China and they realize, well, someone outside of China had called the labor camp and said, I know what you're doing to so-and-so or they were, their name was mentioned in a human wow. rights report or a media report. And so that kind of spotlight from outside of China does indeed make a difference when when the people sort of meeting out the abuses realize that people are, are aware of what they're doing it does make a, a change in things so people felt that the best recourse they had was to shine a light on things and honestly i took a, a bit of a lead from that when when things started to come home for us so you know my wife still has family in china and we were publishing the video game i mentioned that we started collaborating with dashong on was being published by tencent which is a major media company in china and in the midst of making these films all of a sudden you know, the Chinese government calls up Tencent and forces them, forces them to cut ties with my company. And my rep at Tencent is telling me, you know, have you done something not aligned with the Chinese government direction? And then my wife's uh, family members are getting calls from the Public Security Bureau in China saying, we know what you're up to overseas, a kind of 
veiled threat that they're passing on through family members. And, and I recognized, you know, that a lot of times the reason that these stories, as remarkable as they are, are not told, uh, or that pe most people are unaware of this, you know, this dramatic heist of the state TV airways. Well, one part of it is very hard to get a, a direct contact with the people who are involved. But the other part of it is that it's a very sensitive story. You probably can't touch anything more sensitive in China than the persecution of Falun Gong and all of this that's gone on. It's a very, very sensitive subject. And so it's easy. There's lots of good reasons to just kind of not deal with it. And, and that's probably part of why it's gone on as long as it has without some of these subjects being explored. But at the same time, you recognize, well, if I make the same calculation and yeah, I got threats on my business or my family, whatever in China, then who's going to tell this story, right? So you look at it and you say, well, we have freedom here. We should use it. And unfortunately, like I can't make that decision all on my own. So I really respect uh, the individuals who are involved who have more stakes in China than I do. My wife, um, you know, Dashong, other other participants who gave us interviews um, who were adamant that they wanted to tell this story. And, and my wife coming with no background with the, you know, didn't come from the Falun Gong community, but was adamant like this story is important, not just for Falun Gong, but for what for China in general. And, you know, this is a story that needs to be be told. I really respect and appreciate that because it was something that struck me as a story that needed to be told, but it's not something that one person can do. It took a lot of heart, a heart and commitment from a lot of people. Absolutely. And a lot of risk. And that's, I mean, th that's amazing. And I think it speaks to a lot of the individuals involved and the gravity of the situation to be able mm -hmm. to step forward and tell that story again with such authenticity. Um, I want to ask you to, uh, and this is a, per, perhaps an awkward question to ask. There's a lot of discourse about Falun Gong since back in March of 2002, I believe it was when this uh, first occurred and how it's developed into more right wing in the United States and all of that. Do you have a, a sense of, of where that's gone or has it sort of, um, you know, do you have a response to that? I guess I should ask. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, because it's out there, I feel, you know, I made a decision with this film, which was that I feel because I've had an interaction with Falun Gong and I've been in and around the community for a couple of decades, I feel the group is very poorly understood overall. And, and it was a decision for me and, and others involved that it was tempting because, you know, even with with Leong, the sort of mastermind of the hijacking effort, I learned, oh, wow, um, you know, doing some research, I recognized that he had made a trip to Beijing in the early days of the persecution, and he had met with journalists there, and he'd been interviewed by a New York Times reporter by the looks of it, and I thought, well, you know, here's your opportunity to substantiate with a Western news source, what was this guy like, what was, you know, these kinds of things, and I, and I resisted going there because I felt, you know, there's this constant theme of always having to contextualize from our own perspective what another group is, and I felt here what I was able to do, uh, and I hope that people sense that, is to, to just really bring you inside, um, you know, the community and, and see how these people thought about what they were doing and what's, what did Falun Gong mean to them? What, it, what is it that they were trying to achieve and why were they trying to achieve it? And I think that that's really important for creating more understanding. You know, I would say, you know, the thing, especially in the, in the U.S. where politics is so divided and it's so this side or that side, you have a group of people who have been persecuted for a number of years by a communist regime. There's a kind of built-in resistance to um, anything that's perceived perhaps as extreme left or, or anything that resembles what they have experienced. And I don't think that that should be a point of, you know, cutting us off from trying to understand a community or, or a people who, who might, who I don't think should be defined simply by that. So that's, that's sort of my take on it and why I felt it was important to just allow people to speak for themselves and allow the audience to get a view of what a group is without too much of that. I mean, we do have the, you know, the archival of the news footage that substantiates what's going on from a human rights perspective and the human rights reports that substantiate the crackdown and all of that. And I felt that that's, that's valid, but, um, but I wanted to keep it in their voice and allow people to hear them speak for themselves, because I think that's important for creating more understanding. Yeah. And I appreciate you answering that and uh, considering the question, because it's certainly, I think at the end of the day is about the human rights, Travis, the tra tragedies, I should say happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and that have happened. So it's really telling that human story. And I appreciate that you all took that focus. Um, at the end of the day, what do you hope that audiences take from Eternal Spring? You know, there's a few things. I think there are specifics as well as universals. Um, you know, I think that on the specific side of things, what often happens is that uh, a subject is in the news for a period of time when it's urgent. You know, we, a lot of attention 
around the conflict in Ukraine for obvious reasons, you know, but then people start to tire, right? And it doesn't mean that things have gotten better. And the same thing I think with Falun Gong is that it was really in the news sort of, uh, you know, end of the 90s when the, when the crackdown began in 1999 and into the early knots and people were paying attention to it. It was, it engendered a lot of sympathy. And then after a period of time, it's like, oh, that's gone now, right? It doesn't exist anymore. And a lot of people may think that. And I think to a certain extent, that's part of the, the strategy that the Chinese regime has adopted is like, oh, okay, you know what, maybe let's just not mention anything. They used to be villain number one, they were constantly talking about Falun Gong. And now they recognize, well, let's just say nothing and people will think that the issue is gone. But what we find is that, you know, even characters like Mr. White, it's only the last few years that the, the man's come out of China. There's characters in the film who were still tracking, who are under some kind of house arrest, um, you know, who are, and even just in the lead up to the recent Beijing Winter Olympics, you know, they arrested scores of Falun Gong practitioners preemptively concerned that they may draw attention to the abuses they were continuing to face and didn't want that in front of any sort of international press. So this crackdown, it's a reminder that it continues, but then there's also the fact that what has been, um, you know, what Falun Gong has been subjected to in China is not something unique to Falun Gong anymore. If you look at what's happening with the Uyghur population in the Northwest of China, where we have potentially into the millions in terms of the people who are held in these internment camps and very similarly compelled, coerced, abused into, uh, you know, to abandoning their religious belief, their culture, their traditions and way of life. You know, we've seen it with the Tibetans as well. We see the erosion of, of freedoms in Hong Kong and the inability to question state narratives even more there. These things are all uh, things that, that Falun Gong has endured in their campaign. And so the Falun Gong story is important to remember that it's still there, that these people continue to suffer. But at the same time, it's also something that reminds us that what Falun Gong has endured matters to all of us as well, because there are other groups ultimately that are affected by this. And the, you know, the inability to trust the Chinese government, the, the lack of transparency, we saw that come about uh, as major questions, even in the early spread of COVID as well, is like, how much can we trust what's happening here? So these issues that seem local and specific are no longer the case. And I hope that people touch in on those, those universal things. I guess one more layer to add to it is really just this struggle for the truth, which goes beyond China. Um, this whole idea, like if you look at any kind of human rights atrocities, there, when you're gonna get a large number of people to abuse another group of people, to mistreat them, to regard them as unworthy of the rights that other people have, you need to underpin those kinds of actions with a false narrative. You need to, you know, it's fueled by misunderstanding and hate. And you see that, you know, with the aggression that's going on in the Ukraine, you see that with any other kind of massive human rights atrocity against a group of people is you first need to marginalize them and make them less than human, unworthy of any sympathy, this kind of thing. And so I think that the themes here, and this is something that, that folks in the human rights community have touched on right away is, yeah, it's about Falun Gong and maybe this wasn't top of mind for us right now, but it's extremely topical from the perspective of how important narrative is and how important the truth is in combating human rights abuses and in, in maintaining our freedom. So I think it, it's, it's more universal in that regard. Jason, it's a layered film. It's an important film. It is, I think, as you just mentioned, very universal in its messaging. Uh, and is one that I think really is thought provoking by the end, you're the whole, the whole film is a ride. Uh, and it, it, it's just really kind of, I'm like getting choked up a little bit, just thinking about it because it's just amazing that, you know, we, we live in a bubble in North America a lot of times um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just seeing these atrocities that continue to occur. And I think you're exactly right with, you know, it, it it's just a matter of time before things are forgotten and we feel like they're taken care of already and they've stopped and, we've moved on, um, but people are still suffering. So I commend you especially uh, and the filmmakers in order to tell this story, to take the risks that you did uh, and to be so willing to talk so openly about it. Um, before we end, I just wanna ask, are you working on any other projects coming forward? Is there anything more that we can expect from you? Yeah, um, so part of it, I think at, at our studio is a little bit of, uh, maybe it's rooted in my, my attention deficit issues. I like to bounce around and do different things, but. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a VR film. Actually, some of the material that we had in Eternal Spring really struck me, but just did not fit in the film. Part of editing and, and cutting a film together is just choosing what doesn't belong. And so there's a, there's a personal narrative uh, built around Mr. White that we don't get into in depth in the film, but I just felt VR is so powerful from the, from the perspective of being able to put yourself into someone else's shoes and create empathy. So we will have, which will end up being, I guess, sort of a companion piece, which will be a VR short film about 12 minutes long that combines a live action 360 with um, with the you know animated 360 environments that we'll have 
I'm also working on a sci-fi animated series and another narrative video game. So we're, um, you know, we're doing different things, but uh, not at the expense of this film. We put a lot of heart into it. And, you know, with the risks you mentioned, you, you make those risks because you think it's the right thing to do. This story needs to be told, but I've been extremely encouraged, whether it's conversations with people like you who are connecting with the film, the audiences that we show the film to, the awards we've been racking up from juries and, you know, in different festivals on the audience side of things. It's like, there are a lot of people who resonate with it and that makes it all worthwhile. So we do intend to still devote a lot of energy to sharing this film with people over, you know, over 2022 and into the next year as well. I'm glad to hear that. And congrats on all of the, you know, accolades that the film has been receiving for the success of the film. And this will be showing next week at Dances with Films Festival in LA. So uh, good, best of luck there as well. And I hope to continue hearing more and I look forward to that short. Uh, I think that's going to be a really immersive experience that's just um, probably going to get me choked up again. So thank you for that. But it's an important story to be told. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks, Jason. Have a good one. You too.